Hi everyone and welcome to this chat, discussion, kind of review of the Northman film that uh, me and my friends went to see last night. Um, it's not a, a straightforward film review because I'm coming at it from the perspective of someone who is very interested in magic, in shamanic practice and in Viking Age Nordic religions. So that is the areas I'm going to be looking at but I will be geeking out probably <laughs> overly about some of the details that I absolutely loved about the film and you know the stuff that wasn't quite, quite my cup of tea. Um, I will do my very best not to spoil the film, there are any spoilers, I can't promise so do check in the box below and I will write at the end if I accidentally do put the odd spoiler in there, I will do my best not to. Um, first of all, warning alert, I am a wuss, you know, really full on bloody tense, nasty, violent films. I generally, anyone knows me, do not touch with a barge pole, not a horror film fan. I feel like I deal with life and all its supernatural stuff pretty well. I don't fill my head with stuff I don't need to. <laughs> That's my uh, uh, was a little excuse there. But um, I am a student of Viking studies at uh, University of Highlands at Islands. I'm studying an MA in Viking studies and I am super passionate and fascinated in history, in Nordic history, in Celtic history, and basically Anglo-Saxon history. Very, very um, much a geek about that and the sacred land, the sacred sites. So if you don't know me, or if you do know me, you haven't seen my channel for a while, I am Lloyd Alligan. Hello. Nice to see you here. And as I mentioned, I'm a student of Viking studies, but I am also an artist and I have been practicing as a witch for gosh knows how many years. And I'm a tarot reader and I'm a teacher of all the, the, the magic that I create. Um, I've also recently been uh, super honoured to be working as a consultant, uh, a freelance consultant for some of the exhibitions at the British Museum, including the Stonehenge exhibition that's been on recently, that's still on. Please go and see it. My contribution was tiny, it was like this big, but my name's in there and I've been very humble and not talking about it at all. <clears throat> course I've been talking about it all the time um so yeah but, and also I have more involvement in the forthcoming uh the feminine power exhibition um that's coming to the British Museum as well so it's all super exciting um and I wanted to I was excited about seeing the Northmen I was excited for several reasons um because I heard about the historical accuracy that's what everyone was talking about the historical accuracy and I was like oh yes um, I, since I've been studying, I've been a bit of a nightmare about historical accuracy. I've been a bit annoying. Not because we know exactly at all what went on in the Viking era, or particularly in, in the Viking era, era and in sort of Nordic history, because it was not, it was an oral culture. It was a culture that passed on their law and their laws and their religion. Uh, in oral and ritual and sto you know stories and songs and traditions, it was not written down. So you've only got um, things that are written down either a few hundred years later, uh, the Eddas and the source material, um, or uh, by of course people who didn't particularly like the Vikings or didn't like the, you know their victims or uh, basically when Christianity when they were converted to Christianity that's when things started to get written down. So you haven't got that um, first person written account. And even if you do, you, you know, we cannot, unfortunately, time travel, but, um, you know, we can't have, oh yes, it's 100% historical accuracy. There are so many gaps in our knowledge. So it's not that I'm going, hmm, this is not perfectly accurate. Like, I don't know. And I, also, I'm just a student. I'm still learning and learning and learning. But what I loved about the Northmen is how much authenticity, integrity, effort, thought, and just the intention of creating this other space, this attempt to go into that medieval mindset and the magical mindset. So, uh, and, and the details that were put in were just, oh, they were just so good. Uh, <laughs> and of course, you know, um, this is the film itself um, the, or the story itself is based upon um, a story from Saxo Grammaticus, book four, where the story of Prince Amleth is written. Of course, it is definitely not exactly the same as, as the Northmen. Um, and also it is the 
the story that Hamlet is sort of also based on as well. So uh, there's a lot of loose spacing here, but the stories you can see, you can recognise bits of, of course, the, uh, the story in Saxo Grammaticus and also from Hamlet as well. There's lots of weavings there. And even with uh, the fabulous Saxo, this was written a few hundred years after uh, the conversion. So everything you have is written from some some authors want to um, you know to kind of to kind of continue or to preserve uh, the pagan the gods the traditions or the the stories. Some are kind of interested in looking at it, going, "What are these crazy people doing?" You know, um, but it is all all written from a, a few hundred years later. However, with the source materials, I'm always just super happy that we have them. Like we can moan about them as much as we like, but we have them and because we have them we have the the descriptions um from Admiral Brayman of the temples in Uppsala you know we have the stories of the gods that we you know that the Marvel films are loosely based on now you know we have those stories of um of Odin of Thor of Freya of Frey of the the different adventures they went on to and we can unpick the meanings behind them so we have them and that is brilliant so anyway I'm trying not to go off off the topic of the Northmen, of the film. So yes, um, it is loosely based on uh, Prince Amleth's story in uh, Saxo Grammaticus, which is a fictional, true, fictional, true <clears throat> uh, saga. And it's dark, you know, it's super, the film, the film is super, super dark. It is uh, not a feel good movie. There's about three minutes of joy in it and that involves some fabulous Beltane pagan activities uh, or summer solstice activities. And um, yeah, it's absolutely, you know, it, it don't go for it for a happy ending. Not spoiling, you know, it's just not particularly um, a cheerful movie. And you get that from the outset, you know, like Viking sagas, they are often about blood feuds, they are often about revenge. And and it, there was even written for laws things of stopping some of these blood feuds and revenge killings going on because it was destroying generation after generation after generation of families. And so I you can see that in this film. You can see the destruction that these blood feuds and these odes of honour to kill the person that kills your family member and some of the destruction and misery that that actually you know that causes so that's in there as well but what I want to talk about is the the magic the sense of religion and how which is what I always uh, am fascinated by and it is what uh, Neil Price who I know is one of the main consultants in this film and I adore Neil. anyone that is interested in magic shamanism and particularly in the Viking era if you haven't uh, checked out any of Neil Price's work, please do. You will adore him. You will love him. Um, and he is absolutely wonderful. He's created this amazing tome, The Viking Way, which is <laughs> most of my essay stuff is kind of poking out of it. Uh, also, uh, a more kind of whole book about the Viking world called The Children of Ash and Elm, which is highly recommended. This is if you're really interested in, it's called uh, The Viking Way, Magic and Mind in Late Iron Age Scandinavia, which is utterly awesome. But if you want to dip into Neil Price's uh, thoughts and world and thoughts on the Viking world sorry which will I think help you dive into the world of the Northmen more uh, do check out his messenger uh, lecture series which I am putting the link to in the box below because they are so inspiring there's a couple of scholars that really got me on this path uh, Maria Kapilhag is was the first one with her Lady the Labyrinth uh, YouTube series which I can also pop down there as well um, and she's still doing amazing, wonderful work uh, on her Patreon as well, which I absolutely adore. And later on, when I started to study the Viking era more in depth, I discovered the Neil Price is right, which is basically my mantra when I'm doing my essays. <laughs> so, um, yes, uh, do do check out his work if you're interested in magic, shamanism or uh, the, the Viking era and, and the religions of that era. So... He, I think Terry Gunnell, who also I adore his work as well, was one of the consultants, I think, I think, on this film as well. But you can just tell. You can just tell. Because what the Northman does, it doesn't try and give you a, here is how these fights happen, here is this battle. I mean, it, it does give you a bit of that, but it, it shifts your perspective. It throws you into the ritual, into the into the magic and the beliefs that are woven into every aspect of life in the Viking and the pre-Viking era. 
um, because we, however we view, um, however we view these history and this, the religions of history, we are looking at it from a very, very different perspective. The way our society and minds work is very, 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 very different. And however, even as a pagan and a witch, as myself, my beliefs and the way I work cannot be the same as a Viking Age person or a, you know, Iron Age person or whatever, because our realities, our day-to-day -day lives are very different. And also the way we've been brought up to see religion, it's almost like it's a very different a thousand or two thousand years worth of story. So this isn't trying to explain, oh, here is what, here is the, you know, like in some of the sort of more Viking movies, you get the odd outcast seer and that's their sort of, there you go, there's a bit of magic. This film is not that. This film is, you are in it. <laughs> You're in one. Um, you are in that. You can almost smell the incense and the smoke. You are almost on that uh, henbane or mushroom journey with them. You are in the cave, in the burial mound, and it shifts perspective so that you are thrown out of the, the view of, of, oh, I'm observing a story to maybe it calls to some primal part of us that goes, I know that, but it feels very alien. Um, and if you are someone who is a shamanic practitioner, you will know it, you know, even if that side of parts of it feel very brutal and very raw, which is what the film very much is. Um, so I love what uh, Robert Eggers has done around creating that world. And I, and I absolutely, that's what I loved. That's what I freaking loved about this movie and I put a massive smile on my face. You know, I needed a wee throughout most of the movie. I did not move. That is unheard of. Usually I'd be like, oh, I can just miss a couple of minutes. <laughs> Details about films of me, you never need to know. But sometimes you're like, I could just miss a couple of minutes. No, I was not missing anything. I was not going to miss one bit of beauty or power that was woven into the, to the landscape. So um, I haven't watched The Witch by, uh, which is the film by Robert Eggers. Um, I'm pronouncing his name right. I'm sorry if I'm not, um, because of what I told you at the beginning, the caveat at the beginning, I'm a wuss, and I heard it's really, really scary, <laughs> and you probably think that, you know, of me for different things, but it's like my witchcraft and my world I can deal with, but people putting very chaotic thoughts in my head sometimes is a bit, yeah, so I might watch it, because I just love the, f I might watch it, but I might need someone to hold my hand as I do, but I usually, even through the um, Northman, I, I did spend a bit of time behind my floof, behind my wall floof, um, because, I'm not great with it, all the vines. But as a whole, I couldn't keep my eyes off of it. It was absolutely mesmerising. And as I was mentioning, the magic is what I really want to talk about. Uh, I didn't write anything down or kind of, I just wanted to observe it and be in it. So um, from the beginning, you have, you know, runic writing, you have uh, mentions of the Norns. Yes, the Norns are right on my dress here. The Norns, I adore the Norns. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, this is, yes, I mean, it is kind of the base of the story is going to be about fate and destiny and the inescapable fate that kind of weaves through um, Viking and pre-Viking uh, uh, source texts, but also the fact that, okay, if things are inescapable, but there's still a, a, an amount of free will or amount of how you make your destiny your own in that. So, and, and having Bjork as the seeress and in that beautiful corn headdress with the with the um uh, the shells on her eyes i had to watch it again to see um it was just amazing and her with the just hearing that kind of thud of the kind of the the weaving with her as well and she was kind of sp on the spindle it was just mm, yes i adored that and i i'd like to and and the fact that in this film as well again i'm trying not to give too many spoilers away um it's like the magic and the real inter, inter interact they're kind of they're not separate and suddenly they'll just shift and your perspective goes what what what, what? was that real was that not it doesn't matter and this is that you know neil price has always written about that this the others and he writes a lot about that in the children of Ashnell. um the others were you know and i'm probably paraphrasing him here uh, were an every day part of, of of life they were not separate like you don't go to church on a certain day, you don't kind of do that at a certain time and the rest of your life is your own. Even if you didn't, weren't religious or you weren't interested in interacting with the, not just the gods, but more like the, just the, the, the deities and the spirits of everyday life and the ancestral spirits, 
if you didn't have any interest in working with them, you would have an, an awareness of them. You'd have known and you'd know what to, maybe where to go, what not to go. And it could have been a comfortable or an uncomfortable thing. Um, and that interweaving of those world, worlds and the other being a part of, of, of your life is very much seen in, in the Northmen. So from the beginning, when we speak about the Norns, uh, who, again, and the threads, and that, that is spoken a lot about throughout the film, and those magical moments, I was saying magical because it, it kind of describes that, suddenly that other world interaction where you are seeing Valhalla and Valkyries, and yeah, we'll come back to that maybe another day. We'll talk about Valkyries another day. Um, and the Seeress is appearing. And to the bit which I actually really liked about um, going into the burial mound to claim the magical sword and the fight in that because there are zombie like creatures in um, not creatures but the dead kind of the unsettled dead are also a big part of, of the sagas as well and that was in there um, of course that as much as possible the clothing and everything was done and the jewellery amazing amazing details of the jewellery as well um, to as best as things could be done like because clothing is perishable and a lot that we know about the clothing is from burials um, so a lot of probably you know, you sort of gaps to jump on and guess over and also things that are practical and workable um, in a movie as well but it was done so well and what I um, and the, the William Defoe's character including his yeah, I won't say because I don't want to give too many spoilers. Uh, William Defoe's character as this um, shaman, priest, jester character, um, and there was Henbane, I think, in that original ritual in there. And Henbane has been found in burials as well with people. Um, and the, the sort of the the, the journeys, the, the the rituals where things like Yggdrasil were incorporated and seeing your family as part of Yggdrasil and um, and the Queen Nicole Kidman um, Gudrun's um, uh, uh, chambers and there was the Oseberg a, a re, you know a, a version or a reconstruction a creation of the, um, the Oseberg tapestry which is a beautiful tapestry um, found at the Oseberg burial ship burial in Norway which has amazing details about sacrifice and about fate and Norns and maybe Valkyrie and, and it's a very very beautiful powerful and interesting tapestry so th those bits put in there were just wonderful um so also about the so go back to William Defoe's character and later on there is another um which I think that's what uh uh Amleth calls him and and which Cause the, the male character and, and I love in that that um, the, the male witch has these um, like let me go we've got them here tortoise or figure tortoise brooches uh, on his um, costume because that is for, for a man to be a witch from what we can tell in the Viking if a man to be a witch it was Ergi and Ergi is a kind of perversion and linked to feminine. If a, for a man to be ergy, it was linked to being feminine. We can talk about more of that another time, for sure. <laughs> so the fact that he's cross-dressing and, and, and ergy, um, it is a massive insult by all accounts, really, um, to call someone ergy, you know, punishable by outlawry or death. Um, but yeah, anyway, I digress. But the fact that he was wearing those, he was cross-dressing, he was wearing women's clothing, as well as this kind of big, animal hide and working in shamanic practice I just love that attention to detail as well um so consulting the seers was something I think in the in the um movie I I felt like I was a part of I could I was smiling from ear to ear um a lot of the violence it wasn't as bad as I thought I was preparing myself like oh, you know you know what you like you know because what you know, it wasn't as bad. It was expected violence. It didn't overly go into the death scenes, which I was happy about. <laughs> um, which is kind of it. It was what it was. There were some bits which were kind of more oh yeah yeah, and everyone that's seen it will know which those bits are. But um, as a whole, and actually some of it was a bit comic. I think I laughed at some bit. I didn't mean to. I just kind of like, you know, just because it was a bit the way it was done. Um, which is maybe it's more like that way of. Uh, dealing with uh, dark stuff is that kind of humor but yeah 
Um, so we have those magical characters appearing throughout who were so well researched, so well um, depicted, and it, it, it just made an absolute joy. And I've never seen that before. You know, I've never seen that, um, that the, the Viking medieval mind and world to be put on a cinema screen and shown to us in that way it was just and, and in a, a way that someone who has researched it and who loves it who's passionate about it goes yes thank you um and again it's not people looking for a movie that this is exactly how the vikings lived no it's a story and it's a story of a story you know and it's a creative story with a vision that the you know the director had but also taken from a story with its own tropes and context at the time um one would hope that even though life was um brutal and they were showing that really clearly there was no glamorizing the characters which we'll come back to in just a sec actually because i want to talk about the berserkers in just a sec um there was no glamorizing it but it was focusing very much on the violence and the blood and the and the and the that the darker more tragic side of life so and the story itself people have been i heard people complaining that it is a typical revenge story it's like of course it is it's based on a Norse saga and a Nordic saga and, and that is, you know, that is a big theme in a lot of the Nordic sagas. So I like that authenticity of, of kind of keeping to it, not trying to make it too much more complicated, just keeping it to a, a Nordic saga and also more throwing us into that world of magic. So looking at the Berserkers, which is uh, again a contentious issue to whether they're real. I think they were and there are, I mean, that's just my opinion. It is a contentious issue and there are um, uh, metal figurines and plates and um, carvings showing um, men in sort of animal or bear skins or wolf skins dancing you know there is that there is that they seem to be weapons there is that, that uh, um, idea they were real and not just an idea for the sagas but that and also you know we're looking at practices or cultural practices throughout the world where shape-shifting is a thing and in we can say I think even looking at the 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 myths um, for example Freya and, and Frigg and their um, falcon feather cloak you can say a lot about shapeshifting being an important part of the spiritual world of, of the Viking era and the pre-Viking era as well um, so yeah and, and working with that in battle it does seem quite likely the battle frenzy but and in, in the film, the way it was depicted in turning into that beast energy and um, with the, the rituals, the dancing and the fire and the, 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 the drugs that would have helped them get into that space. Because um, we see, it's not really too much a spoiler, to see the young Amleth vanishing off, saying, you know, I will avenge you, father. I will save you, mother. I'll kill you, Fiona. Um, Fiona. And I was just like... I hope you had those chants in my head, but making up different ones for them for the last 24 hours. Um, if you're on there, sorry, I get the names right. Um, and then the next time we see him, he's joined this, he's a lot older, he is now Alexander Skarsgård, and he's joined this um, raiding Viking party um, on, in, in basically raiding the Slavs, um, part of the Rus. And uh, yeah, it's, it's brutal and they show this sort of this transformation this ritualistic animalistic where they are more animal or more beast than man but also crueler than possibly a lot of animals are as well so you've got the nastiness of man and the rawness of beasts as well and again it's not glamorized this isn't something you kind of aspire to be it's pretty darn terrible and they do terrible things but also this is historically stuff that has been recorded it's not made up I mean, it's like all the terrible things kind of condensed into one movie, um, which actually reminds me of things condensed into one movie. You have also um, quite aspects of a lot of um, Ibn Fadlan's account of a uh, Rus funeral. And that's a very well-known account and really interesting account. And it describes, and in, in, in part of the film, not spoiling, uh, there is this funeral and I think it was, uh, I think Josh Rude was saying something about how it's more of a tamed down version actually of what Ibn Fadlan's account actually says about this Viking funeral. Um, 
it's a lot of what we kind of know about um, Viking or funerals, of course, from burials, archaeological findings, but from this account, you know, it's a lot from this account. So, uh, yeah, and I think, yes, yeah, Joshua Root was saying in his video about this that um, it's not as, <laughs> it's not as gross as what the actual account was as yes we see things we see blood you see animal sacrifice you see all these things which of course is not my favorite thing ever but um and the, and the slave girl in it as well you know it's not as gross or as full-on as actually the account was the kind of but i like that they've kind of brought in the wording from that account as well and brought in that idea of viewing into the other world when when uh, the lords uh die so yeah absolutely yeah there's so much to see i, I will go on forever and i'm uh, I, I know i didn't write all this down i'm just kind of going from my memory of seeing it i would like to see it again be be not because it's my favorite film ever as you say like <laughs> you know men fighting each other in a really like there's a lot of going on um yeah it's you know not what i want to see it for though i do enjoy it it was enjoyable but um it was the it was the magic and it was uh you know odin's appearance via the ravens or the crows love that i think it's also mentioned before there are some there are some moments of like <laughs> you know it's not all perfection to taste tasteful though it's everyone's taste what everyone likes but as a whole wow i was just i just loved it you know i just loved the magic of it and that's what i wanted to really talk about the aspects of from the beginning to the end the visions of the afterlife and and the cos cosmology of the viking world was woven into it and so it sometimes makes people kind of go what on earth was going on my favorite not my favorite bit but kind of a funny bit of uh, was when it ends it ends suddenly quite dramatically you don't get these big end credits and songs and stuff like that you know usually goes here's a nice gentle song or a dramatic song to lead us out straight away it just went kind of ended and <laughs> it went very quiet and the, the cinema wasn't that full when I was there um, and there was just 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 two British guys and I just went hmm and I thought that's just such a British response to things hmm and I, was, I just I started giggling then um, but because it was just such it did take you into that other place it took you into that it, it was an attempt to really deeply and intentionally connect with how we can only imagine but also being human as well there are things that okay we can imagine but also you can do a really good job of just being human and just working out you know different paths into shamanic practice into the other world but to go into that and to create that other space where is that happening is that not you see bits and you go is that real or is it not um and actually the fact is that i think both is true and also just things like the, the way the viking or the the viking village was built um i know that robert Edis um you know fad did it actually properly using the right woods and using the building techniques and the boats i think were as historically accurate as they possibly can be and just very very quickly there was one uh shield maiden or whatever one female warrior huge body contention i'm not gonna go into it now because i'm gonna end this video very shortly but um yeah it's the fact that a lot of modern depictions of, of, of Viking films have all these women and we just don't have the evidence that was the case. Like for men to be a witch was Ergi, for a woman to, you know, cross-dress herself and give up that female life, as it were, which would have been having children, da da da, we've, and there's a whole load of things and I'm, there's so much to say here, I'm just gonna have to sort of rein myself back in, but the fact is we don't have as yet, right now, the evidence that there were loads and loads and loads of shield maidens. There may have been, and I'm not writing it out. But because of that, they kept, there was one very wild woman in that, and I just loved it. I love the fact that they made that as not a commonplace, but also how quite terrifying she was and quite amazingly fierce she was as well. So I hope you enjoyed that little chat discussion about the film and the magic involved in The Northmen and a bit about the historical geekiness. Um, if you do like this video or you like videos like this, I have written essays about these subjects. And if you would like me to uh, make videos about them and about these subjects, do let me know. I'll probably do it anyway. 
<laughs> but I just want to know if this is something you'd be interested in. Um, but thank you for watching and let me know your thoughts about the movie. Uh, again, most of it's my opinion and also looking into what I have researched and what I have um, looking into about Viking Age mythology. But thank you so much for watching. Have a great day and I'll see you guys soon. Take care.